most of my life, apart from a brief stint in Cambridge for 10 years, which we don't talk about, do we? No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, I've been writing dark fiction, supernatural horror for a period of time, been publishing anthologies all over the world, and my first novel, The Caretakers, was released at the World Horror Convention in Austin, Texas, two years ago. What I'd like to do is read three stories each of which have different themes. The first one is a story called Daughters of the Night. Now, do we have any M.R. James fans here? I thought know. someone put that. That's a no. Okay. <laughs> M.R. James was a very famous 19th century writer of ghost stories. Um, if you remember back to um, the 1970s, BBC Christmas would always put on ghost stories. And there was a certain story called O Whistle and I Will Come to You, My Lad, which starred Michael Horde. Basically, it was uh, supernatural terror boiled down to the absolute world. This is a man who's terrified of what seems to be haunted bedsheets. How could be more scary about haunted bedsheets? Very, very chilly. And I always wanted to do a modern take on that. So, out of that came the story, Daughters of the Night. Fearful is night to the guilty. It's a phrase my wife read to me before she died. We fear the nights when we're children because of what the darkness might hide. But as adults, we fear it because of what it can't hide. Believe me. Guilt has a physical presence, and trying to wash it away with blood doesn't work. We'd finished another uneasy meal, the silence and tension between us as palpable and oppressing as the stifling heat of the July afternoon. Having a barbecue on an August bank holiday, eating outside to enjoy the weather with a nice bottle of chilled white wine, just like normal loving couples. I guess that's why it's so hard. We were both aware of how normal it was, and we just couldn't do it. The house was a two-bedroom affair, a starter home really, but perfectly suitable for our needs. We were never going to have children. It had a beautiful garden, south-facing, a perfect sun trap. The previous owners had really looked after it. Well-tended borders overflowed with rose bushes and honeysuckle, and the thick lawn sloped gently down to the river that never overflowed, even during the spring flooding. The rotary clothes dryer was the only blot on this otherwise perfect miniature landscape. But the machine was beginning to rust and leaned awkwardly to one side in the post hole. In this light, the bedsheets hanging out to dry were just that, bedsheets. Neatly pegged, evenly separated, water dripping soundlessly onto the neatly mown grass. But at night, they were something else. Sophie didn't know what I'd seen the night before we agreed to put the old house up for sale. And we still hadn't become close enough for me to tell her about it. What I did to stop them coming back. The house should have been a break from the past, a new beginning. But the change of location did nothing but reinforce the distance between us. She eyed me warily from her book as I looked at my paper plate laden with an untouched burger and a half-chewed spare rib. I put it on the patio table and sighed, reaching for the chardonnay. The deep scar on my palm made it awkward to pour. 
Or perhaps it was a stiffness of slowly healing tenderness. I'd cut too deeply last time. Sophie had made even less of an effort with her food than I had. The marinated tuna steak was untouched. I couldn't remember the last time either of us had eaten a full meal. And the results were showing. She was losing even more weight than I was. Her breasts, full and firm ones, barely showed under her vest top. Her once meaty arms and thighs were pale and withered, the sun unable to tell. There was no light conversation, no laughter, the enjoyment of the weather, or the company. She had turned her chair to face the setting sun, lowered her sun hat, and concentrated on her book. I couldn't see if she was really reading the words through the large sunglasses she wore. Very occasionally she remembered to turn the page. How intense, like everything else in our lives. I drained my glass and refilled it. The wine was warm and sour now, but I knocked it back anyway. What's the book like? Sophie flipped the book to show me the cover. I frowned. Matthew Lewis, the monk. Well, it's not your usual choice of reading that, just so. Why we ran out of Tom Clancy and Lee Child, did it? I hadn't meant to sound sarcastic. When she used to lecture in literature at the college, she'd always read some light thriller action on weekends for light relief. <coughs> and yet, this was the first time I'd seen her pick up a book in the last nine months. Any book. That just shows how much time, how much attention we've been paying to each other. Mrs. Kritikos lent it to me, Sophie said. She told me I'd find a few passages interesting. She shook her head. I taught this in a class a few years back as part of the Gothic literature module. I don't know what Mrs. Kritikos is on about. The reminder of her previous career drew a lump to my throat and a tight bit of the jaw. <coughs> More resentment. Not just because she had deemed me responsible, but because I'd managed to hold on to my career. That's why she hated me. That I could be so cold and clinical about it, and not even be reminded of what I'd done each time I went into surgery. The silence was on. I watched the wasp fly away from the sofa's boat, saw it head over the low dividing wall for Mrs. Kritikos's garden. I could hear the screeching of metal garden furniture on patio slabs, and a scratchy old voice in a Greek accent crying, Choo! Go away! So, she was there. Probably listening in on our conversation, her shriveled ears pricking up at the mention of her name. At least I couldn't see her. The old widow, I was assumed she was a widow, keeping the missus with no sign of a man about, made me nervous. The old bag hadn't spoken a civil word to me since we moved in, always keeping her distance. But whenever I was out in the garden, mowing the lawn, or coming in through the back gate laden with a week's food shopping, I knew, I felt, her eyes were boring at me. Perhaps looking at me. Perhaps knowing me and what I had done. I'd only seen Mrs. Kritikos have two visitors in all the time we'd been here. Two other old Greek women, dressed in identical black clothes regardless of the heat, with similar features that marked them as relatives, possibly sisters. They came every Sunday. They would sit umzo and nipple on baklava pastries in the garden, whispering to each other in hushed tones with conspiratorial expressions on faces that were tanned and wrinkled to the texture of old leather from years spent in the Aegean sun. I hadn't seen these two for about six months though. Perhaps they passed on or gone back to the old country. I felt my eyelids grow heavier and heavier. I knew it was foolish to have stayed out in the sun so long, but I was so pale these days that I took every chance I could to get some colour in her face. I felt the warmth of the sun gradually fade, and consciousness faded along with it. 
even Sophie. Matter of fact, down to earth and no, non non no nonsense Sophie had told me once that she felt Mrs. Kritikos was reading her mind. That thin smile on the old woman's pursed lips was half mocking, half knowing. I imagine that smile now was <coughs> off to sleep. I saw her never blinking hazel eyes narrow in recognition of me. Saw her greasy tangles of grey hair flail in the wind like a nest of snakes. Saw her thin lips pick her up and mutter, Fearful is night to the guilty. I was shocked at my eyes. I jerked to my right to where the words had been spoken. It hadn't been Mrs. Critique of saying the word. It had been Sophie. She held up the book she was reading the words from and pointed to the passage. Fearful is night to the guilty. But she marked it with a red highlight. What's she trying to tell me? I didn't answer. I saw the sun sink below the horizon, painting the fields and the river beyond in scarlet hues. The slow flowing waters looked like blood. I knew very well what Mrs. Kritikos was saying. I'm sure Sophie did as well. Night was coming. And with it, the bedsheets would be calm. They would be calm. I launched myself from the chair and ran to the centre of the garden. I grabbed the laundry from the rotary clothes dryer, yanking the towels and bedsheets from the line with clothes pegs spinning off in all directions. All the while, keeping a nervous eye on the setting sun. Just leave them on the line! Sophie snapped when she saw our duvet covered trailing through the ashes and charcoal fragments on the barbecue. She snatched them from my overloaded arms and thrust them back on the road to them. It won't hurt to leave them out for one more night. It's not going to rain, is it? I was conscious of Mrs. Kritikos peering over the wall with narrowed eyes. I looked away lowered my voice so that the old bat wouldn't hear me. Sophie, I told you we can't leave our washing out at night. I'll oh, not this again. What, you think our neighbour's going to steal them? She waved mockingly to Mrs. Kritikos, who mumbled something inaudible and shuffled off back to her rusting patio table. She took a sip of her lemonade and pretended to be interested in the paperback she picked up. I knew that she was still looking at I caught a glimpse of the paperback she was reading. Could just make out a picture of a, of a wasp's face. And the title of them looked vaguely familiar. Some science fiction book I've read in my teens. Something about giant wasps invading Britain after atom bomb tests. Sweat trickled down my neck as I grabbed the wall. I told myself it was the heat of the summer day suddenly turning chill in the cool breeze that sprang from behind the house. A breeze that seemed to whisper, be sure your sin will find you out. A whisper that sounded all too similar to Mrs. Kritikos's voice. I swallowed and turned back to the house, the bedsheets clasped tightly to my chest. The front of my t-shirt was soaking wet with a damp laundry. The dampness that turned as cold as the sweat trickling down my neck when I heard Mrs. Kritikos laugh quietly to herself. Brothers, swallowed noisily and tried not to face her. The laughter continued, reality and deeper. I turned. To see my neighbour merely turning a page in a book and shaking her head in amusement. Her eyes were on the page, not me. I took a deep breath and turned back to the house, wondering how the hell she could read in that gloom. I didn't think about that for too long. The sheets were rustling, coming to life. And I had to stop that. Be sure your sin will find you out. Fearful as night to the guilty. I closed my eyes and swallowed noisily, clutching the edge of the steel drain as I hunched over the sink with my burden. That way, I couldn't feel the kitchen spinning around me or see the floor rear up to swallow me. My trembling fingernails made rattling noises on the drain. It's okay, Soph. 
I held out a hand to stop her taking the sheets away. I'll, I'll deal with it. And who'll deal with you? She stared in bewilderment at the damp linen in my eyes. What the hell's the matter with you? I squeezed the bed linen tighter. Warm, soapy water dribbled through my fingers like the blood I had spilled. I looked up through the kitchen window. I could see the sun sink rapidly behind the trees on the riverbank. I held the bedsheets tighter. Pools of water formed on the tile floor. Oh, for God's sake, Sophie said, give them here. No! My reaction surprised her as much as it dismayed me. I turned my back on her and hunched over the soaking laundry and then began to cry. I heard her storm out of the kitchen and slam the door. Her feet thudded up the stairs. I looked up from the bedrooms and sniffed. But the laundry was inside. That was the important thing. There would be no repeat of that other time, six months ago, when I'd left the laundry outside in the night. But even so, I had to be sure. I heard the slam, slamming of a door upstairs and the shifting of the bed. The sound made when a woman flings herself onto the mattress and buries her head in the pillows, crying uncontrollably. That was good. She wouldn't see what I had to do next. I reached to the knife block and pulled out a broken knife. The black plastic handle was greasy and the blade smeared with fat from the landlord carved yesterday. Washing up was not my greatest skill. Ironic considering that as a surgeon, hygiene and cleanliness of my cutting implements was the first priority. Different when it was cutting up dead meat for consumption. Quick slash on the palm. Just underneath the scar from my last cut, I winced at the brief bright pain and gritted my teeth. Then I pushed my bloody hand into the sheets. It's what I did the last time. An offering, my blood given up in return for the other's blood I had spilled. And it seemed to have worked then because they hadn't come back. The blood soaked the sheets effortlessly, spreading out into dark brown patches that lightened, faded, and then vanished. I squeezed some more of the precious fluid onto the sheets, hoping this would be enough. Time will tell. And then I'll have to explain away another scar on my hand to Sophie. The lie would be even less convincing this time. I slept on the sofa that night. Not just because Sophie wouldn't let me in the bedroom, but I had to stay downstairs. I had to make sure the laundry stayed where it was, on the drainer, in the kitchen. Because if it went outside... Before I drifted off to sleep, images of Mrs. Kritikos seeped into my mind. The old Greek widow doing her laundry of all things. But not in a modern way of shoving everything in a washing machine. Instead, she was washing what looked like bed sheets in a large copper basin, up to her tiny, walnut-like elbows in steaming, hot, soapy water that was slowly turning into a pale pink foam. Her claw-like hands moved slowly up and down, scrubbing the linen on an old wooden washboard. She looked up, <coughs> as if aware that her actions were being observed. Milky white, opaque eyes, dead eyes, turned in my direction. The corners of her thin mouth went up, raising the leathery, wrinkled skin of her cheeks into a smile that looked more like a sneer. Be sure your sin will find you out, she mouthed. Coming back to her. Coming as strange as you are. The water was completely scarred. The harder she scrubbed, the more blood came out. We were not alone. On either side of me, I heard shuffling noises of advancing figures humming the same strange tune. Mrs. Kritikos raised her head and smiled. Welcome, my sisters. Dawn.
daughters of the night. Broken, ragged fingernails dug into my biceps. The arms of the two sisters pulling me towards the wash tub with a strength that belied their age. I was pushed to my knees, my head forced down to the scarlet water and the thing that hid within. I woke with a cry to a strip of silvery moonlight bathing my sweat-drenched face. My clothes were sodden with sweat and made a sticky ripping sound as I pulled myself away from the leather sofa. I sat on the edge, running my fingers through my hair and making an effort to control my shaking. I leaned over and pulled the curtain shut. The moonlight vanished. My mouth was dry. The thought of drinking something after the memory of blood slipping down my throat wasn't welcome, but I had to get rid of the thirst. I went to the kitchen and flipped the light switch. I blinked in a sudden glare. Then, with eyes half squeezed shut, I pulled a plastic beaker from the cupboard and filled it to the brim with water from the cold tank. I drank greedily. As I refilled the mug, my eyes fell on the drain and saw that I longed the beaker fell from my hand and spilled water. It bounced, rolling on the tiled floor and coming to rest by the jam of the door that led to the garden. And that door was ajar, open. It shouldn't have been. I remembered locking it before crashing asleep on the sofa. Unless Sophie... Unless Sophie... I inched the door open and peered into the garden. The heat of the evening had gone, replaced with a chill breeze. The moon had disappeared behind a bank of thick cloud, and the garden was in darkness. I could just make out silhouettes of the brick barbecue, the dividing wall between our house and Mrs. Critiki's, Mrs. Critikos's, and the rotary dryer. I couldn't believe what I saw. The rotary was covered with damp bed sheets. The assembly creaked with the weight of the wet linen, turning slowly in the post hole, and that creaking was accompanied by the steady dripping sound of water falling to the grass. They weren't pegged out in the neat, orderly manner that Sophie always used. Instead, they'd been dumped on top of the dryer, clumped with soaked material bulging through the rails and trailing in the drying grass. This was not Sophie's work. Breaking the scudding clouds around the moonlight to cast a faint glow to the laundry. The breeze grew stronger and the linen billowed like the shrouds on the sailing vessel. Shrouds. That other definition of the word came to mind. The breeze whistled mournfully through the folds of the sheets, the wind twisting them on the rosary into strange shapes. I could see that there were no clothes pegs holding the laundry to the dryer, and I thought it was only the weight from the dampness that kept them in place. The wind picked up and the rotary shifted, turning again with a screech of rusted metal. The shrouds were given new life and new shapes were formed. It took me a moment to realise what form the bed linen was taking. My attention was focused on the spreading red stains that appeared on the sheets. Small teardrop patterns of scarlet provided a grim contrast to the luminescent white cotton of the duvet and pillow covers. Teardrop patterns that increased in size and number became spreading pools of the same liquid that my nightmare visitors had tried to drown me in. The smell of honeysuckle and roses from the garden gave way to the unmistakable scent of freshly spilled blood. Blood that was no longer confined to stains on the laundry, but now dripped steadily onto the grass. The breeze soughed through the bleeding laundry, carrying Greek accented words to my ears. Be sure your sin will find you out. Fearful is night to the guilty. The breeze changed direction spinning the rotary in the opposite way and sending small <coughs> droplets of blood flying, spattering on the bricks of the gas barbecue. The linen ruffled again, and the, thaw and the form the blood-washed laundry took was unmistakable. Hoods, voluminous sleeves, and billowing robes, three sets of them. They looked similar to the habits that monks wore. 
and just like that worn by the cowled figure in the book Mrs. Kritikos had lent to something. The rotary emitted a chorus of shrieks again, but this time it wasn't in protest at the wind. It was a noise made by something within the animated laundry. The topmost parts of the bedsheets rose in the unison, shifting, rippling folds of linen formed into hoods that pointed in my direction. The moon was masked by another bank of thick cloud, but the luminescent quality of the sheets remained, making the darkness at the centre of the hoods even darker, a darkness that saw me. A darkness that imparted a terrible life force to the material that surrounded it. The rotary dryer screeched once more before crashing to the ground. The three sets of shrouds stayed upright, freed from their prison. Free to move. Armless sleeves raised and pointed invisible fingers at me. The wind was stronger, whipping the sheets against the things within and outlining their invisible bodies. Bodies that had a vaguely female form. They might have been beautiful once, but the breasts outlined were shriveled and sagging, the arms skeletal, the female curves, hollowed scoops in wasted flesh. The blood had stopped flowing. It was now nothing but dry, copper-coloured stains on the sheets, sheets that still glowed from the moonlight. Moonlight that no longer shone. The rest of the garden was in blackness. I could no longer see the fence posts, the gates or the brick barbecue. Just an all-enveloping curtain of blackness, pierced by the illumination from the horrific figures in its centre. I turned quickly, my breath catching in my dry throat, heading for the other source of illumination. The light from the kitchen, harsh electric light, but oh so welcoming. It was man-made, it was artificial, but it was real and it offered shelter from those things of the night. So I thought. The door closed easily enough. The lock turned smoothly. Those things were out there in the dark, and I was in here, safe in the light. I sank to the floor, breathing rapidly. Kneeling on the still warm kitchen tiles, I let my head sink and fought to regain control of my breathing. Retinal images of the harsh ceiling light streaked across my eyelids like shooting stars. I pleaded for them to stop. I opened my eyes and choked back a sob when the retinal images stabilised. Still vain, opaque white shapes, but now no longer spinning. Now I saw them approaching through the fluted glass of the kitchen door. Even brighter now, because with a soft ping, the bulb in the kitchen light blew. I couldn't see the green glow of the digital clock in the microwave. Had that gone as well? A power cup? Even the humming of the refrigerator had gone. Just as in the garden, the only illumination came from the three white shrouded figures. The three figures that came through the door. Passing through the glass panel as if it wasn't even there. The sheets rattled soundlessly as they entered the kitchen, looming over my crouched and cowering figure. Three arm-like segments of the linen rose above my head, fingerless hands pointing accusingly through the blood-drenched linen. I heard a hissing noise, like air escaping through a faulty tire valve. <coughs> I looked up into the faceless face. A drop of blood ran down the end of one of the folds and into my turned face, slid into my panting mouth. It was warm and coppery, freshly spilled. That taste triggered a reaction in me. I stood up and screamed, tearing through the nearest of the bedsheets, trying to get to the hallway. As I did so, I had a sensation of immense coldness passing right through me. A slimy wall of freezing damp fog that took my breath away. I gagged on the stench of putrefying flesh and rotting offal, and heard the humming of feasting blowfires, the stench of death and the grave. A moment that lasted an eternity. A moment that was illuminated by a faint grey light that barely showed the mouldering bones and empty eye sockets that wept blood incessantly, dribbling down the fleshless cheekbones and around the lipless cavity of a mouth. The humming gave way to that hissing sound. Scores of leaking air valves, 
and now I knew what caused that sound. The sheets parted like curtains rotted with damp and mildew. I felt sharp claws clutch at my t-shirt and had allowed a louder hissing from the nest of snakes that crowned the thing within the bedsheets. A reptilian chorus of anger and hatred as I made my escape. Be sure your sin will fight you out. Fearful is night to the guilty. I staggered up the stairs, my shoulders bleeding from the scratches made by the thing's invisible, skeletal fingertips, crying uncontrollably. My mouth was filled with the taste of blood, and I shook violently, not just with terror, but with that bone seeping cold that had barred my path. A cold I knew would never leave me. Nothing would leave me. That's why I knew it was pointless to escape. Instead of heading out of the house and away from the daughters of the night, I had to go and face my crime. The bedroom light was on, even though no other lights in the house were working. They wanted me to see my sin fully, untouched by darkness. I heard them pause on the bottom of the stairs. The bedsheets fluttered on the new post, ready to move upwards. Sophie. Sophie was naked, motionless, on the double bed. The mattress was bare, the bed sheets, the bed linen, Sophie put on this morning had gone. But I don't remember taking them off. The knife protruded at a downward angle in between my wrists. I cried out, realising now that she had felt the guilt just as much as I. The new slashes to her already scarred belly and her vagina proved that. The belly in which our baby grew. The lips of her sex that would have brought the child into the world had I not insisted on the abortion. Had I not performed it myself. The fear left me, replaced with an overwhelming sadness and sense of utter exhaustion. All this time, she had hated herself for going through with it. And she couldn't open up to me. We couldn't discuss it. We were murderers. But that crime had pushed us apart rather than brought us together. The baby. The baby was too far gone for termination. But knowing what it was going to be born as, I knew we had no choice. As the child grew in her womb, Sophie had had a gradual change of heart, her emotional bond with it increasing with each day that passed. The physical bond had been easy to cut, but the emotional one was hard. She had often remarked on my coldness when I discussed the operations I performed, but as a surgeon you have to be detached. Even when I cut the fetus from Sophie's body, I was completely distanced from what was before me. I hadn't considered the swollen belly as part of my wife. I just saw it as a job to be performed, clinically, efficiently and professionally, as was a disposal. Wrapping the fetus in the marital bedsheets, smuggling it into the hospital in the simulator. If I'd allowed my feelings to intrude, I heard an approach. I heard something that sounded like female laughter. I stood and pulled the curtains to one side to look at the garden. The moonlight had returned, and I could see clearly the empty rotary clothes dryer lying on the moon's silver lawn like some ancient beast that had long since died and rotted away. I could see it was a Mrs. Kritikos' garden as well. The book was face down on the patio table, the glass of cloudy lemonade still half full. Her black clad body lay slumped and lifeless in the garden seat, her arms dangling by her sides, her head back and looking up to me, her mouth open as though snoring. But even from this distance, there was no mistake in the glazed eyes that stared lifelessly into mine. I felt no surprise or fear. I was completely detached. I wondered what time she had died. And I had this strange feeling it was the same time that Sophie had killed herself. That is why the three of you were here to haunt me. When before, it had been only two. The sisters hadn't gone back to Greece. They had passed on, waiting for their last sister to make up the trinity before returning to me. 
I remember the title of the book now. Keith Roberts, The Fuels. A strange title, a story about giant wasps. But the theme was one of cosmic retribution. Mankind suffering for its crimes against nature. And the book by Matthew Lewis, she had given Sophie, contained a quote, fearful is night to the guilty. I understood them. The Furies, the daughters of the night, will ensure no sin goes unpunished. As true today as it was in ancient times. Matricide and patricide were the most heinous crimes in the classical world. But our age and culture now has a different perspective on what is the worst crime and the worst murder you can commit. The crime may have changed, but the punishment hasn't. They will torment you to madness and they will never leave you. This is what I attempted to explain at my trial when the prosecution tried to get me to admit to killing my wife. They argued that the only fingerprints on the knife were my own. I had offered blood to wash away my sins. I thought that's what they wanted. And they did. They did blood. But not my blood. The bedsheets of my cell soaked with my cell offerings. Offerings that were rejected because the blood remains the next day. They've had the blood they wanted. Now they just want me. And they have me. For all eternity. Night is falling. And the bedsheets are coming to life. They caress me and they struggle. They suffocate me in that freezing cold miasma of death. Making me aware that this is only a foretaste of what will come when I finally kill myself. Night is eternal. That is why we, the guilty, fear it so much. <coughs> okay. Something a little bit lighter now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we can. Everyone happy to take a little break? Yeah, yeah, just get around. We will resume with Fox Live. No, not Fox Live. Got time for a fat game. It's all the exploding bullets. Demon Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> the most <laughs>